Who are the world's most interesting people? And what fascinating, groundbreaking, incredible things can they teach us? In this new series, I leave our Science of People lab to interrogate, I mean interview, my favorite authors, experts, and celebrities for them to share their best people hacks, social skills, and stories. And let me tell you, they have some juicy tips. This is a new series I'm calling The World's Most Interesting People. Hello, hello, YouTube friends. I am so excited to have Kristen Hadid on the show today. She is the founder and CEO of Student Made, a cleaning company that hires students. She's also the author of Permission to Screw Up, which I just finished and loved, so I had to have her on the show. Kristen, welcome to World's Most Interesting People. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So you have such a fascinating story, which I was amazed to read about, especially your entrepreneurial journey. Can you give kind of our viewers a little bit of a rundown of your journey to success? Yeah, I am what you might call an accidental entrepreneur. Um, it was never my intention to start a company. I went to college for finance. I thought I wanted to work on Wall Street. And when I was 19, I fell in love with this pair of jeans that I could not afford. It sounds so silly, nope, nope. but I just, yeah, I was like, I have to have these. So they were 99 bucks and I didn't have that. So I put an ad on Craigslist to clean someone's house and I charged exactly the price of the jeans. And uh, like, a woman, yeah. don't even need tax. Like yeah. just because the jeans. No, I said plus tax because I didn't even have enough money for the tax. But a woman hired me miraculously and it went terribly, but she really needed help. And so she ended up teaching me how to clean and hiring me back to come every week. And so that's how it started, but slowly grew, never thought it would be my career. And then the turning point happened right before I graduated from college, I got this contract to clean hundreds of empty apartments. And so I hired a team of people to help me. And I always say that there was this really defining moment that happened for me um, during that, that contract. I lost 75% of my team. They walked out on me, 45 people. In, one, in like one hour, right? Like one day? One, oh. Same same moment. And I was 21. So that this was nine years ago. Oh. And um, I, when I look back now, I realize that that was the moment for me that I became obsessed with leadership and with learning how to be a better leader. And I think ultimately is the reason I chose to stick with this business to see if I could figure it out, you know, figure out how to make this work. So my company student made, we are still around and we hire primarily students, but everything that we do is about learning and growing and teaching people to become stronger leaders. And we just so happen to clean toilets and vacuum while we do that. So one of the things I love about your story, and you, and you just mentioned it again, is that you learn on the spot. You learn on the job. And so first of all, your first job, she kind of taught you how to clean. Magical, right? Like learn from your customers. No better way to do it. And then second of all, here, you know, 45 people quit on the spot. And you have to learn right then and there how to be a leader, literally on the spot. So my question for you is actually, do you have any leadership resources that you've used over the years that have helped you in a more systematic way, you know, after the fact? Yeah. Well, I think reading is huge for me. And I did that early on. I still do, do that now. And I actually took a speed reading class oh, so that I could read a lot in one sitting. And now I listen to Audible. I love Audible when I'm on planes and stuff. But I think, I think there's a, this part of you have to keep teaching yourself and learning. And, and you think you mastered something, but then there's another challenge you know, that comes across as soon as you've mastered something. So it, 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 the learning never stops. Also great mentors. And I find that having mentors outside of my industry really helps me because they offer a different perspective. And maybe, maybe what they're talking about doesn't work for my business, but I can figure out a way to tweak it so that it does. So I was very lucky to have some great mentors, but I still learn the same way I did back then. And it's, I just try and I, I say, okay, you're human. You can only try your best. And sometimes things work and sometimes they don't, but the key is when it doesn't work that you learn from that and you do it differently going forward. And eventually you'll find the thing that works. Mm -hmm. So did you, have, did you have like leadership books or podcasts that you love? Oh, I have so many. Um, so let's see. Um, Delivering Happiness is one of my favorite books written by Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos. Yeah. And that book really taught me about what culture is and what it means to build a culture in a company. And I always thought culture was about having a ping pong table. 
or beer on tap, you know, and no, it's way more than that. And it's how people feel. And so I think reading that book helped me define early on that the most important thing was how people felt when they came in the doors of our office and when they left. Um, I love Leaders Eat Last, Start With Why, both by Simon Sinek, but and and Simon wrote the wrote the forward to your book. Yes, he did. He did. But I what I've learned from Simon is the importance of making people feel safe mm-hmm. and how to feel how to build an environment where there's trust because as a company grows and as people grow, you know, there are crazy challenges and sometimes fear gets in the way and if people feel safe and trusted, it just you you get through that stuff a lot easier. Can we do? Can we break that one down? Because I I could not agree more that psychological safety and trust, especially in professional settings, is really important. As an employee, how do you create more trust in your in your team? And as an employer, how do you create trust or safety in your team? Because I think that it actually can go both ways. Do you have any practical kind mm-hmm. of tips or action steps? Well, I think that vulnerability is is really where trust is born. So I think when, when you're talking about how do you build trust amongst the people you work closest with, you have to build a relationship with them and you have to be vulnerable. And so what that means is you have to talk about not just work, but your personal life and who you are outside of work. It means that you have to share when you don't have the answers and admit, you know, I messed up or I need help because that's also being vulnerable at work. And I've learned that we, we trust people more when they are vulnerable, when they're actually human, when people act like they're perfect and they have all the answers you don't trust them because you know that no one's really perfect. And I think on the employer end, it's how do you create an environment where people feel safe saying, hey, I don't know how to do this. I need help. Because some people fear that if they say that, it will make them look incompetent and like they can't do their jobs. But really, if you create an environment where people feel safe saying that stuff, you get further along. So as the leader going to your people and saying, hey, Let's talk about stuff that didn't work this week or that went wrong or where do we need help and making those conversations a regular thing. So action step here, I think for everyone watching, and I I try to think about this too, but we forget because we get really, I don't know about you, but in the day-to-day grind, we get very into our agenda, very into our to-do list. And so we're just hitting off those things that, and nowhere on my to-do list does it say, share a story from your weekend or uh, talk about a recent failure or talk about something you're nervous about. Like that's not on my list. So Unless like there's a specific space for it, it doesn't happen. So I think an action step maybe to think about here is whether you're an employee or an employer is to think about how can you create a dedicated time or space to share those stories. That could be a warm up at the beginning of a meeting. It could be um, you know opening up a call with a little bit of chit chat before you dive into your agenda. It could be creating a space um, in your physical space, like in your office, for people to do that. Um, what's what's your guy? Most of your employees they must be since they're students. Virtual? Are they working remotely? Do you have an office space? How does that work? Yeah, so we have a we have a headquarters. You know, our students they come in, they work in teams of two, but during the day they're out all across town. Okay. We have an executive team. Some of some of our team is here locally, some remote. And you actually touched on something that we do. We start every single meeting with what we call personal check-ins. And it's just two to three minutes. We go around the table and we just say, Hey, this is what's going on in my personal life. And that's how every meeting starts. So it, it shows a few things. Number one, that you're putting people before business yeah, and, yeah. you know, before the numbers and, and the goals. Um, but two, it, it creates that, that regular, you know, we're, we're definitely checking in. We're learning more about one another because that, those conversations just don't happen. We're so busy every day. Okay. So, so you have to create this space. I love it. So I have a team meeting literally after you, I think in two hours, and I'm going to implement personal check-ins. Like we're going to do it like after yeah. this. Okay, and and by the way, I think that if you're whether you're a manager or not, you can begin to do this or ask permission to do this or create space to do this. I think that 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 takes a little bit of courage, but like courage and vulnerability put together. Yes, yes, you can totally look to the person next to you and say, "Hey, let me hear about what's going on in your life." You know, you don't need anyone's permission to ask that question. Do it, just do it. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about this. Leads me perfectly into we talked about trust, culture, employee retention. So I back in the day, a lot of people don't know this about me. I ran a tutoring business, and I was that's why I was so like, oh man, like this so resonates with me because when I was in college, I was tutoring on the side for extra and then I couldn't take all my clients. So I started working with other tutors and slowly grew a decently sized tutoring company uh, for a few years. And our biggest problem was retention, meaning that student schedules, uh, really hard to keep people in a job that's so variable. And that's something I never quite figured out. So I was wondering if you figure out a way to increase loyalty 
um, and lower reten- like lower um, people leaving for other things. Yeah. You know, the cleaning industry has a terrible turnover rate. 75% is the average for the industry. So and it's, it makes sense. You know, the, the work is so unglamorous. It's not fun. And then usually you don't have enough money to pay people, you know, more than a living wage. And so it's, it's like, what incentive do I have to stay here and, and do this work? Exactly. And uh, yeah, so I think for us, what we found is you have to give people a reason to show up. You know, why, what is the purpose behind this? And it's not just to clean something. There's gotta be a bigger reason. And what we figured out for us, it's we wanna help people grow and learn. And so while our students are learning how to dust and vacuum and clean mirrors, they're also taking classes that they're paid to attend and that are mandatory, but where they learn about things like how to build a meaningful relationship with someone and how to confront someone about something difficult and how to recognize someone in a meaningful way and how to find your strengths and articulate them in an interview when you leave here and you find that next step. And there are things that really don't have anything to do with their jobs, but that really help them become, you know, better, better in, in leaders and, and able to make the impact they want to have on the world when they leave. So that's why they show up. And now people say to us, is this the place where you learn how to become a leader? I want to work here. And we say, yeah, well, you have to dust and you have to vacuum. But that's, that's part, that is what leads to loyalty, I think. So we have students who will stay with us until they graduate and then so they, they move on. on. Tell me about the mechanics of this because I love it. Like, I think it is so incredible that you provide this for students. How does it work like from a logistical standpoint? Like someone works with you and then they have certain amount of hours that are learning hours or certain amount of hours that are, that are cleaning hours. How does that work? Yeah. So when they first come on, they will take a four hour workshop where they learn a lot about, you know, relationship building, listening, confrontation, recognition, stuff that really doesn't have to to do anything with the job. And, And that's their first real introduction to the company. So we're setting the message that, hey, we want to invest in you. We care about you. So this class that you're getting paid to attend isn't even about cleaning. And is it virtual or is it in person? It's in person. Oh, cool. And then they go through um, an online training course, which is where they actually learn how to clean. And there's a little bit of hands-on training there. And then throughout the year, we offer different workshops. We do something once a quarter called Development Day, where we close the company. We bring everyone together. It's the only time our entire company gets together. And we focus only on leadership development. So I I think the point is, we don't do that much. You know, we have the four-hour workshop, a quarterly event, and then maybe occasional workshops that are optional A lot of the learning happens on the job just because we give a lot of autonomy. So they don't have a manager over their shoulder. So they have to figure it out on the job. Right. And I think that the takeaway is it doesn't take a lot. You know, it's not like you have to have classes every week. It's just something to show your people we care about you and um, we're investing in you. Can I um, donate some Captivate books to your, um, like, long-term cleaners? Please. Please. Okay. I would love it. So we have the paperback coming out, and I'm going to send you a box of them. And um, I would love to contribute to that. Like, that is such an amazing. Okay. So for everyone watching, action step here, I think there's two things. Uh, One is thinking about what you want to learn in your workplace. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with your job. Like, for example, I've had employees come to me and say, hey, you know, I know that we don't do much graphic design work necessarily right now at Times People, but I I really, like, love the visual aspect. Could I take a graphic design course with education budget and then maybe try out some of our graphics? Yeah. I'm like, yes. Like, I, I didn't even know that you had that interest. And yes, we have education budget. So thinking about what you want to learn on the job and is there a way to use education budget or tie it into the job or at least add it on because that, I think, allows you to put more ownership into your position. And then, of course, as a manager, is there a way that you can encourage learning that isn't just about job training? Ah. I love it. And also in the comments and YouTube, make sure to tell us if you have this going at your company or if you have ideas as well. So I have one more kind of big question and it has to do with reading people. So you are constantly working with new people, whether that's clients or hiring students. So you have to be so, you must be good at kind of speed reading people in addition to your speed reading course. Do you have a system for speed reading? Do you believe in like that gut first impression? Like what, tell me about that process for you. Oh, yes. So I think hiring is probably the best analogy to, to use here. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about a student named Jade. And this was years ago. She walked into my office for an interview. And I remember feeling right away in my gut, she is so student-made material. You know, I, I just knew. And the interview went great. And everything went great. 
And at the time, we had these requirements. And one of the requirements was you had to have your own car because you're driving from job to job. Yeah. And she didn't have her own car, but she'd walk to the interview. And I didn't give her a job because she didn't, you know, fit that one box. And later I regretted that choice. And I thought, you know, someone who walks to the interview is probably someone you want to hire because she was on time. She was early, actually. She could probably figure it out. She could probably figure out how to get to work. Yeah. So I called her the next day. I said, Jade, I thought about it. I really want to give you the job. And she said to me, I would so love to work with Student Made. That was my first choice. But when you said no, I told someone else, I gave them my commitment. And I'm the kind of person that when I say I'll do something, I don't back out. And so then I'm like, oh, I really should have hired you. You know, that's exactly who you want to hire. So Jade, Jade made me realize that you have to trust your gut. And every, if I look back, every single hiring choice I made where I had that gut feeling like, oh, I don't know about this person. My gut was always right. And I, that's, it's my compass. You know, if, if your gut is telling you something, listen to it. It is always, always right. A hundred percent believe that. So I, my actions, have, I agree with you. I was hoping you were going to say that. And I, I kind of had an inkling from some of the stories yeah. I read. My action step here for viewers, and this is like a really one that I really encourage you to do is I don't think that you either have intuition or you don't. I, I think that we all have it innately, but we do have to kind of develop it. And the nice thing is, is, you know, you've been hiring for years. You've been able to see, ooh, I didn't have a good feeling about that person didn't work. I had a good feeling that that person did work. So we've had lots of practice. I also am constantly interviewing and hiring. However, not all of us get that opportunity. So what I would say is, actually try to hone that instinct. And this doesn't have to be just professionally. When you meet people socially, kind of keep a little tr- like a little log or track in your head of that first impression was good. Did it always end up being good? You know, mm-hmm. if I really liked someone, did it always stay that way or was I disappointed? Or was I surprised? And try to hone it like a skill because I think that our intuition must be developed and doesn't have to only be professionally. It can also be socially or romantically. Right. And I think even asking yourself, I think a good way to train that and to grow that is to ask yourself questions. So in hiring or whether you're interviewing for a job, it's, you know, asking yourself, how would I feel if I had to work with this person every single day? Or how would I feel if I had to walk in these doors of this company every single day? And just get get in that habit because whatever those answers are, that's your that's your intuition. Totally. I totally agree. And that's, I think, a perfect place to end the interview. Kristen, where can people find you? Obviously, we want them to get permission to screw up. Where else can they check you out? Well, you can go on my website. It's just kristenhadid.com or Student Made's website, studentmade.com. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Everyone who's watching, let us know your tips below in the comments. And again, thank you so much for being with us. Yes. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Did you love this video? We love you too. Please give us some love by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. You might also like these videos to check out after this one.